Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out. My name is Alexander McDonald. I'm the business administrator for the Township of Milburn. Tonight, the Township Committee has asked us to bring together our professionals that are dealing with the current builder's remedy lawsuit faced by the Township of Milburn. In order to have a productive evening and be able to effectively conduct a question and answer period, we ask the public to once again keep their comments and questions to three minutes. There is a large crowd, probably expect a few more people later. I want to make sure that we can get through as many people as possible that may have questions. The township's professionals are going to open up with a brief introduction of themselves um, so that you understand who they are and, and where they come from, and also make some uh, opening statements regarding key points of what the township is currently facing. Much of the description of the settlement agreement and the zoning ordinance was described at the September 3rd township committee meeting, so we will not rehash that information necessarily, but again, sort of expound on some other points that need to be made. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Christopher Falcon, who is the township's attorney. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kit Falcon. I'm the township attorney. I've held that position since about uh, 2005. In that role, I am uh, providing legal advice to the governing body, to all of the township's departments, occasionally to the committees. I supervise all of the legal affairs of the township, the litigation in which the township is engaged or has initiated, um, and that's in short my uh, portfolio. Um, I have been a mayor of my hometown, Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, a councilman, planning board there for eight years. Um, we had the unfortunate distinction early on in the affordable housing litigation department to be sued by the public advocate to force upon Mountain Lakes and a number of other municipalities uh, affordable housing obligations which uh, had to be slugged through. Um, Alex asked me to indicate some of the municipalities we represent. Uh, our law firm, Mary Falcon, we're over on JFK Parkway and we are uh, almost uh, really entirely engaged in the representation of local government entities in uh, land use, uh, affordable housing, uh, redevelopment. Uh, the municipalities where we're currently providing these services uh, are, in short, Salem City down in South Jersey, Summit across the way, Palmyra Land Use Board, Long Branch, Neptune, Asbury Park, Carnes Point, Pompton Lakes, Newark, Bloomfield, no, Bloomfield, Harding Township, Flemington Borough, Hoboken, Berkeley Heights, Milford Borough, Greenwich Township, and Morris Plains Planning Board. As you can tell from that list, uh, that's a smattering of urban, suburban, and rural municipalities, which might be a good indication of the fact that the, these affordable matters, affordable housing matters, are being uh, considered and decided in every kind of municipality throughout the state. Um, what I uh, would like to do uh, is kind of set the table uh, for the discussion tonight. Uh, as I guess just about everybody here, and many of you were there last Tuesday night, the Township Committee introduced an ordinance to approve a settlement agreement in the current litigation brought against the Township uh, by the Silverman Group under the name of one of their subsidiaries, um, and to adopt a zoning ordinance to implement the provisions of that settlement agreement. Uh, a great many people came forward uh, not happy about what was happening, uh, expressing uh, their uh, various objections and comments with respect to it. it. It became apparent to me, and it became apparent to the mayor and members of the township committee, that um, many of the people who had come forward were kind of um, thinking in the mode that the township committee had all of its normal authority that it has in the, in the approval or disapproval of developments uh, when they're presented to the municipality. I'm going to show you in, in shorthand here why that really isn't the case in uh, builder's remedy lawsuits. 
the comment was made to me afterward uh, that, uh, and it was made I think during the course of the commentary, that uh, it didn't seem that this had been very transparent, that this uh, kind of left out of nowhere. Um, the township has a policy uh, which has firmly followed for a long time that when they're engaged in litigation, they do not talk about the particulars in public session or answer questions about that, although they do provide updates as to you know, where a case might be or when it has settled and that sort of thing. In this instance, we had the additional fact that Judge Gardner, who has this case, uh, directed that a mediation be conducted in absolute confidentiality. He made that very clear. You, you don't come out of this mediation and start to announce at public meetings who said what. They had this negotiating position, and we had that negotiating position. That was, that was just off the boards. So, yes, it was, it was not a transparent proceeding. And I also understand the fact that not everyone sits at home following every little thing that the township does. And uh, only when they finally come out to a point where something might be happening or it's getting implemented that people like yourselves get interested in it and come out and express your views. Uh, we're hoping that tonight we can kind of uh, at least uh, explain the groundwork and the parameters of uh, uh, wh where we are at the moment and where we anticipate going. Uh, the township did hold two public sessions on affordable housing which were fairly well attended. Uh, I think the township committee had anticipated that these were issues that the township was going to have to face uh, in upcoming years. So a couple of years ago, Ed and Paul and I uh, held these sessions. I think Alex put them on the television or the website or something for people who were having trouble sleeping around midnight. <laughs> Doing that one anyway. uh, we, we tried to explain the origins of affordable housing and how that was all unfolding. Um, let me skip ahead. I want to explain the distinction between the normal development process and this builder's remedy lawsuit and the process that comes out of it. Um, as I think everybody knows, uh, if you have an application for development, you, you want to build a building or you want to put in a, a subdivision of houses, um, the applicant comes to the town, reviews the zoning ordinance, makes their plans accordingly. Well, let's see, we have, we're only allowed to be 30 feet from the street, and we have to be sure to have 20 feet on both sides. And the building can't be higher than the 35 feet tall, and they come in with an application that meets those requirements. And to the extent that they don't, then they have to apply for what are you know, called variances, because for reasons I won't enumerate, they think they're entitled to a slight variation of those requirements, they can apply for a variance too. I've said this uh, at a number of public meetings uh, over the years, that in connection with um, builder's remedy lawsuits, your zoning goes out the window. The builder does not have to come in with a project that meets the requirements of your zoning ordinance in terms of any of those things that I just mentioned and other zoning requirements. Um, the background of this, however, I'm going to just, and if you'll bear with me, I'm going to be very brief to give those of you who are not aware of it how the law came up to the present situation, originating really back in 1975. You hear, uh, you probably heard, or maybe you heard about Mount Laurel and Coa. Uh, in 1975, the Supreme Court uh, bought into a theory that was circulating at that time that municipalities were abusing their zoning power so as to prevent people of modest or low income from ever being able to develop in their community by virtue of the fact that they were requiring lots to be large and that the scale of the homes that were going to be built on those large lots were obviously beyond the means of people who were in need of affordable housing. They decided a case and they said that it's a constitutional obligation of every municipality in New Jersey to make certain that there's a reasonable opportunity 
for the construction of low and moderate income housing within their borders. Well, not a whole lot happened. It was like, thank you, court, for telling us that, but builders were not rushing to do that because most builders wanted to build upscale housing or large residential developments and really weren't too concerned with that. The court saw what was happening. So they came along with a second lawsuit and what they did was that they created an incentive and they called it a builder's remedy lawsuit in this sense. It says to the developer, if you will include within this project that you're proposing an element for affordable housing, you will be able to develop that project to a greater intensity than you would normally be able to provide it provide for it under the existing zoning of the community. So they got a bonus in terms of intensity, size, etc., uh, for including within their project. They then developed uh, the Fair Housing Act and the, and the development of COA, the Council on Affordable Housing, which began to administer uh, these programs with the uh, regulations that are more Byzantine than you can imagine, but nevertheless establishing numbers for what each community was obliged to were three rounds of <clears throat> years during which, segments of years during which municipalities were obliged to try and do this. But hanging out there all the time was that uh, if the municipality had not met its obligation to provide for affordable housing, then the developer comes along and says, well, I now own this piece of property over here and I'm gonna develop it and I'm gonna include in there an affordable housing element, and you're going to have to allow me to build it into a larger scale than would otherwise be provided. All of those tools with the municipality, or many of them, that the municipality has in the normal zoning situation where the applicant comes in for developer development and the planning board says, oh no, we don't like that, put it over there, and oh no, we want the driveway to go that way, and we want this to be stacked back, or we want the, uh, uh, the property to be further back, uh, from the front line in order to line up with the buildings along the street. Those kind of things, that, that, uh, that goes out. Uh, and I, I, I kind of felt the other night that the governing body taking it on the chin for being accused of not standing up for the municipality. Why don't you make them do this? Why don't you make them do that? Uh, when their power in these situations is limited in a way that uh, Ed will uh, explain to you when he kind of lays out the typical context in which an uh, affordable housing case takes place. Put in real short terms, in place of the zoning, the judge appoints a special master. He was there the other night. The special master is the one who in reality will recommend to the judge what ought to be built there. The special master in our case, Frank Banish, was there the other evening. He was directed by the judge to convene a mediation over which he presided. And we had many sessions, and I can't get into a lot of those details, uh, back and forth, up and down, as to what this was going to look like. But there was no question that it was going to be built. Uh, the question really kind of uh, fell into the details. And I think I can safely say this. The judges in these cases, they have really had the wood put to them by the Supreme Court. The court, when it saw that COA was no longer a working organization, took back the administration of affordable housing. And the Supreme Court said to the judges in all of the counties, they appointed special judges to hear these case, cases, make this housing happen. And the judges who I know who are hearing these cases are telling me all the time they're getting calls from the administrative office of the courts. Why aren't these cases going? You should get more housing underway. What's, what's, what's happening? They are particularly attuned to the recommendations of the special masters who are planners, who hear a lot of these cases, who serve as special masters in a lot of them. And therefore, it's important that the special master come away from the mediation uh, feeling that the settlement is something that can be recommended to the court and is likely to be approved thereafter. Uh, he said the other evening that he felt that the plan that had been 
uh, devised through this settlement was a superior approach to meeting the constitutional obligation. He made that statement during the course of his presentation. So at this point, Alex, unless you want me to say anything more about that, Ed, maybe you could talk about the typical scenario. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Ed Buzak. Uh, I have a law firm in Montville, New Jersey. I have been the planning board attorney in Milburn Township since 2013. Uh, but like Kit Falcon and Joe Marazzini, his partner, the three of us actually uh, cut our teeth in the little town of Booton, New Jersey, in Morris County, <clears throat> as young lawyers. And one of the first cases that I handled in 1973, when I began practicing, was an exclusionary zoning case. This was before Mount Laurel became Mount Laurel. Uh, it became the doctrine that Kit just explained. Uh, but it was not dissimilar uh, to the underlying concept that Mount Laurel, the Mount Laurel case ultimately established, and that is that municipalities were excluded or uh, practicing exclusionary zoning <clears throat> by not allowing a variety and choice of housing opportunities that would allow <clears throat> for uh, individuals and households of all different incomes to reside within that municipality. Uh, from that humble beginning in 1973, I was involved in the case that Kit just mentioned um, Mount Lakes was involved with when the public advocate sued 27 Morris County municipalities. At the time, we had represented three or four of those municipalities. That case started in 1978, and in 1983, while the case was still pending, Mount Laurel II came down, which created the builder's remedy, and I wound up trying uh, the case on behalf of the township of Randolph in Morris County, in 1984, before Judge Skillman, one of the three judges uh, that were appointed to handle all of Mount Laurel cases in the state. Um, we, Randolph was one of four municipalities of those 27 that had not settled their case and went to trial. Uh, we tried the case for two weeks in Middlesex County before Judge Skillman, along with the other three municipalities. Uh, two of them settled early. Uh, we settled after two weeks <clears throat> uh, and brought us into, or brought me, into the first uh, Supreme Court case that I was involved with, which, which was in 1985, when that concept of the Fair Housing Act that had been adopted by the legislature was challenged. Um, I represented Randolph in that case as well and argued the case before the Supreme Court in 1985. <clears throat> the Fair Housing Act was upheld. Uh, and since that time, uh, I've been practicing in this field uh, and in the municipal field almost exclusively and in the affordable housing field uh, for effectively my entire career. Uh, I am uh, chairman of the New Jersey League of Municipalities Committee on Affordable Housing that was created in uh, the, the mid-80s right after the Fair Housing Act was adopted. I've been chair of that committee uh, since that time and continue to chair that committee. In addition to that, I represented and represent the New Jersey State League of Municipalities, first as one of three assistant counsel that they have, but more importantly in this context, I represented the New Jersey State League of Municipalities in all of the litigation uh, from the time that uh, it, the League of Municipalities, sued COA in 2008 challenging the regulations that they had adopted. Uh, I was part of the Supreme Court decision, uh, the oral argument in 2012, right after Hurricane Sandy, and the decision that came down in 2013. Again, on behalf of the League of Municipalities, I was also representing the League in the 2015 case that resulted in, as Kitcher said, <clears throat> uh, having the courts uh, resume responsibility for affordable housing and snatching it from the hands of what was then, by then, a dysfunctional Council on Affordable Housing. Um, I represent uh, nine, uh, ten municipalities in these affordable housing cases, uh, three in Bergen County, uh, Milburn, six in Morris County, uh, 
and uh, have been special counsel for a number of other municipalities in the state. So this is not something that I do as a sideline. This is something that I do as my career. And I only say that because I think you need to understand that <clears throat> the professionals that the township has retained in these cases are not people who have never been involved in affordable housing cases or in affordable housing at all. I've spent my entire career since 1973 involved on behalf of municipalities exclusively in affordable housing cases. Uh, Kit talked about the fact uh, that a builder's remedy matter is a little different, and I won't reiterate what he has said, but I think it's important for you to understand very briefly the process that evolves when a municipality uh, is approached by a developer contending that it, the municipality, has not satisfied its constitutional obligation. The first thing <clears throat> that happens is the developer comes in and alleges that the municipality has not satisfied its constitutional obligation and proposes, as Kit said, a development that includes some set aside for affordable units, typically at a higher density, so that those additional units that the developer obtains by uh, proposing this more intense development will be able to subsidize the low and moderate income units. And up on the, on the table, well, it was up on the table, I guess they've all been taken, are income limits for 2019, so you get a sense of the household size and the income levels of the low and moderate income families that we're talking about and how that, how that is gauged in actual dollars. But in any event, developer comes in and, and makes that contention. And the first thing a municipality does is evaluate whether it has satisfied its constitutional obligation. Because if it has, it can tell the developer, thank you very much, but we're really not interested in doing this. That evaluation takes place really in two contexts. One, whether the municipality has obtained what was known and is known as a, a uh, substantive certification. Substantive certification was an imprimatur that was placed on the municipality's housing element and fair share plan by the Council on Affordable Housing, who made a determination that the municipality has indeed satisfied its constitutional obligation by providing through its land use ordinances a realistic opportunity for the construction of its fair share of the region's low and moderate income housing units. The chart that uh, shows the income shows that we're in region two, we're a four county region, Warren Union, Morris and Essex, and it's that regional need, just not the need that's created in Milburn, but the need that's created in that four county region that is assigned in part to all of those municipalities within that region. So you look to see whether or not you've received substantive certification. Well, Milburn has not received substantive certification. It never had substantive certification. It never took advantage of the Fair Housing Act and the administrative process that was there since 1985. So when a developer approaches and says you haven't satisfied your obligation, you look to your substantive certification and find you don't have any. The second way that you can obtain it is through what's known as a judgment of compliance and repose. It's a very similar process, except it's done judicially. So you look and see whether you've gotten a judgment of compliance and repose. Sometimes that's done unilaterally by the municipality filing an action in court, as Milburn has now done in a declaratory judgment mode, or it results after a builder's remedy lawsuit has been filed, and that case has been resolved because when a builder's remedy lawsuit is resolved traditionally, it includes the resolution of the entire affordable housing obligation, not just on that developer's property. They get priority in terms of being able to satisfy a portion of it, but the municipality has to then go on to satisfy the balance of its obligation that's generated as a result of that builder's remedy lawsuit being filed. So Milburn looks to that, and we don't have a judgment of compliance or repose. 
So I guess the appropriate thing to do is to sit down with the developer and see what he's proposing. And that's what happened here. There were discussions over a period of time, and the parties negotiate. Uh, you know, the negotiation process is like any other negotiation process. But at some point in time, that negotiation process comes to an end. You reach a point where each side has, in their view, given up everything they can give up and or has obtained everything they can obtain. And the parties then look at that and evaluate it. And this is not rocket science. This is what happens. Parties evaluate it and say, are we willing to settle? This is it. This is the end of the line. Are we willing to settle this case or are we not willing to settle the case? If you're willing to settle the case, then you move forward to accomplish that and to implement it. If you're not willing to set the, settle the case, in this context, people go back to their corners. The developer goes back to his corner. The municipality goes back to its corner. And many times, as in this case, the lawsuit is filed because there hasn't been an amicable resolution of that case. When that lawsuit is filed, as I alluded to, the parties don't start where their settlement discussions ended. Because if you start where the settlement discussions ended, there'd be no reason to go back to court. You just keep negotiating. What happens, of course, and again, this is not rocket science, what happens is the parties go back to their respective court, and the developer looks for more than that last number that was not acceptable to anyone, and the municipality looks for less. So you need, everyone needs to recognize that the illusion that has been alluded to at times that, well, this ended somewhere around 62 units, and now this proposed settlement is 62 units. What did you get? You have to recognize the fact that once the builder's remedy lawsuit is filed, they're not at 62 units, and we're not at 62 units. We're at two different places again. So in this case, again, as, as Kit Falcon pointed out, Judge Gardner got the case sent it to mediation, and the parties begin to mediate from those two corners, the corner over there for the developer and the corner over there for the municipality. Sometimes we come together, and people might say, well, wait a minute, I don't understand it. How can you start there and start there and come out essentially where you were before and think that that's a good settlement? Well, part of the reason for that is that you're in a different context. You're not in the negotiation phase where one side has more ability to negotiate, has a stronger legal position than the other. Once a builder's remedy lawsuit is filed, the situation changes, the burden changes. Up to that point, there's a presumption of validity of a municipality's zoning ordinance and an entire land use regulation in the sense of what is allowed. Once a builder's remedy lawsuit is filed, the burden shifts because, as I said earlier, the municipality did not obtain substantive certification. The municipality does not have a judgment of compliance and repose, so it no longer has the protection of that presumption. And now the burden switches to the municipality having to prove to the court that it has satisfied its obligation when the municipality doesn't have a judgment of compliance and repose, and when a municipality does not have substantive certification of the So the dynamics change entirely. They shift entirely. And the parties are in different positions legally. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole negotiation process, but I think it's important for everyone here to understand the, the mechanics, the dynamics of the process. And, and not assume erroneously that everybody starts at the point where settlement negotiations broke off. That's not the way it works. It just doesn't. And it doesn't work that way in affordable housing litigation. It doesn't work that way in litigation. It doesn't work that way in union negotiations and collective negotiation agreements. It's not the way it works. So that's where we are now. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the numbers that we have to contend with as the municipality. 
as Kit said previously, the uh, Council on Affordable Housing had established numbers for every municipality in the state. When the Supreme Court made the determination that it was going to take this back, COA was no longer viable, did not make the number. So now there's a number of experts who are out there who are proffering numbers of municipal obligations. And I was involved in the litigation down in Mercer County, which was one of two litigated cases in the methodology field, where determinations were made there in Mercer County, but really statewide, for numbers. And let me tell you what, what the numbers are very briefly. The municipalities, if the municipality utilized an expert that municipalities in the state have utilized, that we utilized down at the trial in Mercer County, the obligation of the Township of Milburn from our expert who would likely be utilized we don't have an expert, but this is one who we'd likely utilize, was 946 affordable housing units. Not units, not total units. 946 affordable housing units. If you go to what Fair Share Housing Center says, their expert, Fair Share Housing Center, is a housing advocacy group that is involved in virtually every declaratory judgment action, and I dare say most builder remedy actions. Their number for the township of Milburn of affordable units is 2,611 units. Affordable units, not total units. And if you're talking about a 20% set aside, where you reserve 20% of your market, your total units, you're talking about 10,000 units that Fair Share Housing Center represents the obligation of, of the township of Milburn, of which 2,600 would be affordable. The Mercer County decision that Judge Jacobson rendered as a result of a 41-day trial down there, that number for Milburn Township would be 1,516 units. So that's the proverbial nut that we have to crack as a municipality in terms of attempting to satisfy our obligation. So when you look at the settlement, when the township looks at the settlement, it has to look at that in the context of what its obligation is that will be proffered in court. And even in the best case, you're talking about almost 1,000 affordable units, 946 affordable units. So keep that in mind as you evaluate the settlement that is before us, because this is only one part of Milburn's resolution of its constitutional obligation. There's still the entire balance of its obligation that it needs to deal with. Let me pass it on to Paul Phillips, our planner. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm Paul Phillips. I, I am the township uh, planner. Uh, I've been practicing as a planner in New Jersey for over 35 years. My firm advises several dozen uh, municipalities in the state on planning. Uh, redevelopment and affordable housing matters. I've assisted uh, a numerous municipalities in affordable housing litigation over the last several years. In that vein, I've made many court appearances as the municipal housing expert, and that would be at uh, the hearings on fairness as well as the municipality's compliance with the Mount Laurel uh, mandate. Um, I, I just want to pick up on something that Ed talked about a little bit about the cases that uh, have been litigated to date, if I may, just briefly. Uh, and Ed was involved in the Mercer County case. There were two municipalities in that case that basically did not settle. They went on uh, to uh, 
uh, proceed to trial. It was basically a numbers case, and they got hit with very, very high numbers, both municipalities. I think it's fair to say that they will admit that they did not do very well. Uh, there was also a case in Middlesex County. South Brunswick was the only municipality that didn't settle, and Judge Wolfson hit them with a 2,900 unit obligation. That provides some context. The, the other thing I want to talk about, Ned, as the attorney, can jump in on this, but there's a case that came out in the last week uh, in Englewood Cliffs in Bergen County. Oh, come on. And the Englewood case, Cliffs case, did not settle. Uh, and the scary thing about the Englewood Cliffs case is the judge, and the judge went against the special master's recommendation on this, took away their immunity. And I will just caution you that the last thing this municipality needs is to lose its immunity because beyond the Silverman Builders Remedy litigation, we still have to deal with getting an approval from the court on our total affordable housing plan. Uh, and we would lose total control if we lost that immunity. Secondly, I'd just like to echo Ed's comments that the world, uh, in the municipal world in New Jersey changed in March of 2015 when the state Supreme Court put the Mount Laurel mandate back in the hands of the court. And as Ed mentioned, and I can't emphasize this enough, that this is a builder's remedy lawsuit. So the burden of proof shifts to the municipality. It shifts to the township of Milburn to demonstrate and has to do this, again, in the context of a, and I'm going to round numbers, a thousand plus unit obligation and a municipality that had done nothing proactively for the prior rounds of affordable housing, which will be taken into consideration by the court, uh, that this site cannot reasonably support densities and heights that might not otherwise have been contemplated. That's the test. That's the test, as Ed described it, the burden to shift. So we have to look at this particular site and its immediate development context in that vein. And let me just say a few words about the site. The site is commercially zoned. It is a stone's throw from a train station. And by the way, I can point to other transit-oriented developments along the same Morrison-Essex train line where the densities of transit-oriented development have been equal to or higher than the density that is proposed as part of the settlement agreement. The site is bounded on the other side of Chatham Road by a railroad line. It abuts two municipally owned vacant properties on two sides. It abuts the Arboretum on the other side, uh, which is essentially undeveloped at this point. It, it, it abuts directly across the street commercially zoned property as well as a garden apartment complex which is two to three stories in height and it abuts vacant municipally owned lands. Please don't interject. You'll have your time to get up and, and speak. Where? Where the closest abutting single family residential property is 200 to 30 feet away and is separated by a wooded, vacant, <laughs> municipally owned lot. This is the context that's going to be taken into account by the court and the special master if this case does not settle and goes to court. Uh, again, there is not an immediately adjacent abutting single family residential property near the site. The closest property is 200 to 300 feet away and it's well buffered by adjacent woodlands and those ladies and gentlemen are the facts with regard to this particular site. You also have a site with a significant grade change from the abutting streets. That's both Chatham Road and Woodland Road which allows for the structured parking on the site to basically be set into the slope below the building and integrated within the building design. This, the grade change where the, where the site drops off from the public streets, also basically it means that the building height at its highest point is well below the level of the street and the public view shed. The structured parking, there's no surface parking contemplated at full build out of the site. The structured parking basically allows the densities to be higher because the site's not taken up with surface parking, such as directly across the street 
where there's a com combination of below building and surface parking. That allows for a greater density. The last point I want to make on this, and again, this is something I can't emphasize enough. I mentioned this during the introduction of the ordinance at the Township Committee meeting, is that we've negotiated a very detailed 12-page zoning which incorporates safeguards, mitigating measures, design standards that, are, that seek to basically uh, get the highest quality design out of this project. I will tell you that all bets are off the table with those standards if this doesn't settle and basically goes to a builder's remedy lawsuit. As Ed said, the 62 units go off the table. The last point I want to make before we take questions has to do with the issue of the master plan consistency. There's been a lot of misunderstanding about what that means and what that doesn't mean. Uh, and as many of you in the room were aware, there was a planning board meeting last week uh, where it was determined that the, uh, the zoning on the site is inconsistent with the current master plan. And the facts are the facts, and it is inconsistent with the current master plan. So let me kind of explain that a bit. When the planning board adopted the housing element and fair share plan in 2018, there was no determination yet as to whether or not this site was going to be part of the plan. This site is also excluded as part of that plan from the uh, township's vacant land analysis because the property basically is improved with buildings, so we were able to exclude it as part of the vacant land analysis as a potential inclusionary housing site. So again, now that there's been a builder's remedy lawsuit, uh, if we settle that suit, if the governing body passes the uh, ordinance on second reading, ultimately we're going to have to revise our fair share plan down the road. We will ultimately roll this zoning and land use designation into an amended housing element and fair share plan so that at some point in the future it will indeed be consistent with the master plan. Now let me tell you about the implications of it being inconsistent as we sit here this evening. The municipal land use law allows for a governing body to basically uh, adopt a zoning ordinance that is inconsistent with the master plan as long as a majority of the full authorized membership of the township committee basically votes in favor of it and as part of the resolution states the reasons why they are basically adopting an ordinance that is inconsistent with the master plan. And very simply, the reason that the municipality would be doing that would be to settle a builder's remedy lawsuit. That's the simple explanation, and I want the public to understand, because my sense was there was some misunderstanding of what the inconsistency did and did not mean. So that's all I have to say at this point. Okay. Thank you for your patience on those opening statements. Um, certainly it's important to, to hear what they had to say and now it is gonna, <clears throat> what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn it over to the public for a question and answer. I'd like to just, a couple real quick housekeeping things. Um, in order to expedite those comments and those questions and for the professionals to have the ability to respond, uh, we're asking that you keep those to three minutes um, so that we can try to hear as many people as possible. Also, the information that was handed out tonight will, all, will be available on the website tomorrow. We are videotaping this meeting. That will also be on the website tomorrow. And uh, residents that weren't able to attend or would like to view it again will, will be able to do so. Keep in mind, too, that the Township Committee is holding a public hearing on the settlement and zoning ordinance on September 17th, 7.30 p.m. at Town Hall. At this time, come on up. Ask your questions, please make a line in an orderly fashion. And uh, as, as always, and, and I know that our community um, doesn't need to, to be reminded of this, but we ask for your decorum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just heard two of you guys mention if this case goes to the court, Speaking of my Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna ask you to state your name too um, and your address so, so that we have that record. Okay. So my question is, um, so I heard, uh, is it on? No. No, you can't. This one? Okay. 
Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I heard two of you mentioned that when this case goes to the court, it's going to be the municipality's uh, burden to approve certain uh, mm -hmm. compliance. Uh, just for the paper I pick up over there, the last paragraph is in the summary says, if it goes to the court, the developer will have to prove that first, the township is not complying with this constitutional requirement. Second, the developer has proposed a development plan. And third, there are no environmental or other constraints on the developer's property that could do that, right? So I want to ask the first of whose burden it is to prove all this. And also, there are three prongs. So particularly, my question is about the last prong, the environmental constraint or other constraint. What's the legal standard for those constraints? And you know whether there's any case law and any situations other municipality actually use that prompt to prove their case. Uh, with regard to the uh, burden of proof, the three elements that are cited in that uh, in that memorandum uh, are the three elements that a developer has to prove. But the question is the presumptions that you have, whether or not it's presumed that your zoning ordinance is valid. And that presumption ends, and the municipality has the burden to demonstrate that its ordinance is in fact valid. So that's how the burden shifts when you have a builder's remedy lawsuit. With regard to the other two elements, the substantial number uh, or significant number, I think is the, is the term, of affordable units, that's based typically on the percentage of set-aside, which has generally been established through court decisions and through COA of being a 15% set aside for a rental project and a 20% set aside for a sales project. In this case, uh, the municipality was able to negotiate a 20% set aside for a rental project. So the significant number is not, is not a, uh, a base number, it's, it's a percentage of the market units that ultimately uh, are established. The third one with regard to environmental issues or environmental constraints <clears throat> are items where that site cannot be developed. If that site cannot be developed, for example, if there were contamination on that site, environmental contamination, uh, pollution, so forth, leaking gas tanks that could not be remediated, then that site, despite the fact that it was a builder's remedy site, would not be suitable for the construction of housing, probably wouldn't be suitable for the construction of anything. So those are generally the environmental constraints. I, I uh, would add to that if there are, for example, wetlands on the property that are exceptional wetlands uh, that have 150-foot uh, uh, buffer requirements that would preclude the development on the site, those cannot be ignored by a developer. Those are not trumped. If there's a riparian buffer that the DEP has established, that cannot be trumped. So those things are looked at, but if those items are not present, or permits can be obtained through the DEP, or mitigation can, can be uh, taken, or buffer averaging can be done, there's a variety of ways in which the prohibitions can be uh, addressed. If they cannot be addressed, then the developer can't build in spite of that. If he can address those, or if there are none on there, then the developer is typically given the ability to build the project. Okay, thank you. And um, so another question is that, you know, just, sorry, do I have a few more minutes with that? Yeah. Just well, one question. Uh, yeah, go ahead, and I'm just going to ask though, as as as, the, as you do come up and ask questions, that you then go back to your seat so that more people can ask okay. questions as well. Otherwise, we'll keep having sort okay, of sure, additional sure. questions. I'm sorry about that. So I do. My question is, I know you just uh, cited some cases where when the municipality lost and how much units that was, you know, um, kind of forced on the municipality. So I I wonder what's the statistics of uh, the you know, all the lawsuits that actually went to trial, you know, like, uh, do we have the series of uh, the, the winning or losing rate, and um, like how much it eventually um, it goes to, like, that as a scale as you just said. I think it, as the planner has, has mentioned, there were actually <clears throat> uh, two litigated cases, uh, one in Middlesex County with South Brunswick Township, 
the one that I litigated in Mercer County that started out with five municipalities that that uh, were, were defendants in the case, <clears throat> ended up at, after 41 days with only two left. And those municipalities uh, uh, were found to have the obligations, as Paul said. Princeton was about 750 or 800 units. Um, West Windsor was 1,500 units. Uh, and, and I might add that those numbers were about half of the number that Fair Share Housing Center was contending those municipalities should have. So despite the fact that they got, and now this is just the Mercer County case, I can't speak to the South Brunswick case because I was not involved with that, but it was about half, but the numbers were still staggering numbers for those municipalities. So when you look at our numbers, when our own expert is talking about a number of almost a thousand units, you see the, the uh, bar, the hurdle that the municipality has to overcome. Hello, my name is Susan Blackburn and I live at 11 Inwood Road in Short Hills. Um, you discussed the environmental factor. Were you aware that there was a massive underground storage tank leak on this site? That there were, there were not at one time just one gas station on this corner, but there were two. They didn't have uh, the tanks that are required now. They were forced to put them in, and, and I'm not even sure that Ray's ever did put those tanks in. So when you're talking about environmental, you could have walked into the uh, negotiating room and had those that information, but it doesn't seem that you did. So I don't know what other factors in the area you may not have been aware of. Um, and the other question I have, looking at the traffic impact study, and it's just July 24th, 2019, is when you did your traffic study. <laughs> in the summer, when the town is basically evacuated, we have many people who come from abroad that leave town for the entire summer or for at least a month at a time. 7.30 and 8.30 was the a.m. peak hour. The trains start filling up here at 5.45 a.m. and they don't stop until 9, until the 8.54 a.m., which is the one I take, and I, I can barely get a seat on the train now. Uh, peak hour in the evening, 5.30 and 6.30. Sorry, again, it's more like 4.30, to 8.30, and you are talking about people going in and out when there was no school in session. I just, I don't understand how you could treat people like they weren't people. We are more than just a number, and the issue is not about low-income housing. That is an obfuscation. That is not the issue. We keep coming to the meeting and discussing the same thing. It's about quality of life. And if you think we're a stone's throw from a train station, well, take a look at that street. Somebody, as you all know, we have an unsolved vehicular homicide there. And everything the town tries to put up to get people safely from one side of Chatham Road to another. At, in summer, we had somebody put it up, a thing that went viral on YouTube. The train station got so flooded and Chatham Road got so flooded that people could not drive there. People couldn't get up the steps there. It, it turned into a well. So I would just like to be treated as a mature adult with a postgraduate degree, okay? Because you're talking to a group of people here that are very sophisticated, mostly have postgraduate degrees, probably 20% of us attorneys, and I would really appreciate getting the straight talk and for you to hear what we're trying to say, which is not that we are against, but we would welcome the diversity here. We just want some. <laughs>
comment on the environmental issue. If, if indeed this site has the contamination under the settlement agreement, uh, the developer is required to comply with all environmental requirements. If there is contamination there and that contamination cannot be cleaned up, this site will not be developed. Um, getting the information so that they prepare for the negotiation? Uh, I, would just, I would just like to make two points, and, and, and certainly this will go fast, but one, I don't think that anybody up here intimated that anybody out there was against affordable housing. I'd just like to make that. I think the idea is that that is, that is the issue facing the township. Not that anyone well, is against it. That we're facing is that developing. I understand. Okay. I understand, but at the township as a whole. There's more to talk about. There's more to talk about. There's things that we agree upon. Let's okay. talk about. Okay, Mrs. What Black, we don't if you could, upon. if you could be seated. Thank you. I, I just want to make there. I just want to be clear that that was not intimated up here. Also, um, I think that to the point of the environment, and you, let me know if I'm speaking out of turn, but the, that's up to the developer. If they didn't do their due diligence, then. In the end, the, the, the project wouldn't be built. How would you know? How would you know? Wouldn't it be better to have the information beforehand? Isn't that what a prudent representative and advocate should have done for our township? That's what the developer did when he bought it. Um, Stephanie Messer, 79 Stony Lane. Um, I have a comment and a couple of questions. First, um, you mentioned that um, you didn't believe anyone um, insinuated that uh, we're against the affordable housing um, part of this development. But I think on I think I saw on Facebook and social media that there are some residents that are accusing other residents of being against it. But so, first I believe I am speaking for the majority of my neighbors when I say that our opposition to this development is not in any way related to the affordable housing that is part of the plan. In fact, I support the building of affordable housing in this town. It is about time that this town owns up to its constitutional mandate, and I applaud the present township committee for doing so. I also understand that a builder's remedy lawsuit puts the township between a rock and a hard place, especially because before now, the town refused to confront its constitutional responsibility in any way, shape, or form. In my ideal world, this developer, Silverman, would balance its rightful profit-making motive with some sort of social responsibility to not only the neighborhood, but the entire town of Milburn Short Hills. If I was a part of, or a developer, or if I was Silverman, I would take a good hard look at how this development is so grossly uncharacteristic of the surrounding neighborhood in terms of size, height, and sheer square feet. I would also study its impact on town schools, town traffic, flooding, sewage, and train crowding in both Short Hills and Milburn. But alas, I am not Silverman. Making, making a profit at the expense of a neighborhood and a town is just not in me, which is why I am not in a profit-making business. So, why all the anger? Because I feel that this neighborhood and this town was not fought for hard enough, that expedience won over responsibility. So my question is if this, if we do not settle and move forward to fight this development in court, what is the worst case scenario? Um, and if the town lost in a builder's remedy lawsuit, does a court have the right to put limits on a builder's plan? For instance, does a court look to the town's master plan? Does a court take into account the fact um, that that Silverman Group already has its present tenant, Summit Medical Group, um, you know, reserving um, space in this new development. Then they have the 62 units on top of that um, tenant. So what is the profit margin? Does, it, does, it, does the court look at that? How much the developer is making on top of what he is already making now? Um, and can a builder, for instance, put up 100 units? Can they put up 50 units? Where does it stop in a builder's remedy lawsuit? Thank you.
make the uh, difficult observation. <clears throat> there are a number of elements that were just mentioned that uh, people think should have been taken up in the mediation. Uh, you, you really didn't come prepared to talk about the schools. Well, the schools wasn't on the table. The schools don't get on the table in these mediations. What the judge wants to know is how many affordable units can this town build? Oh, you know, there aren't going to be enough classrooms for the students who are going to come out of this project. Oh yeah, build classrooms. Mm -hmm. Judge, there won't be enough uh, sewage treatment capacity, which isn't a problem. You have more capacity than, you know, than God. Um, but in municipalities, uh, judges put uh, scarce resource orders on. Nobody else can get any storage capacity until the affordable housing uh, development gets their capacity. Um, the traffic study, that didn't come into the mediation. There was no discussion of traffic. The mayor, in response to comments that had been made for, by citizens who came to the meeting, saying, gee whiz, what's going to be the traffic implications, said to Mr. McDonald, have our traffic consultant take a look at this. We want to get an idea of what his opinion is. But it does not come to the table in the mediation that, oh, we're sorry, uh, that uh, number of cars that's going to be coming in and out of there uh, really can't be accommodated. Uh, that the school children need to be protected as they walk to school. Oh, we'll get a crossing guard, put up a traffic light. I mean, when I say the burden shifts in these cases, uh, that's the unhappy aspect of this, that the normal considerations that you all would want the town to take a look at and decide, uh, kind of go out the door and we're going about what's it going to be, what's it going to consist of, and how many affordable units can be developed out of there. Anybody else want to just I just wanted to say one thing to answer your direct question. There is a risk and exposure on the municipality's part that if this goes to litigation, that the ultimate remedy here could be more than 62 units. There is a risk. Why didn't there a limit? That's, that's my question. Can the judge say, ah, oh, you, you can build 10 stories. You can make a building that's, you know, 100 stories. What's the limit? What is, what is the judge? I, I can't answer as I sit here what the judge is going to think is acceptable or not acceptable. Any of us would be speculating. What I will say is that there is indeed a risk that the remedy could be more than 62 units. It could be significantly more than 62 units. And I say that again in the context of a builder's remedy stand, uh, lawsuit with a huge obligation in the municipality. This will all be taken into account by the judge. And the judge basically will also re rely on the expertise of the, of the judge's own expert, which is the special master. All those things will be taken into account. And I just wanted to answer your direct question. I can't speculate, nor will I speculate. But there is a risk that it could be more than 62 units. Because the special master actually go to the neighborhood and look at the neighborhood and look at the... What's yes, he does. The one, the one other thing I, I want to add to this is that if you had the opportunity to look at the housing element and fair share plan that the township has filed, its contention is uh, that it has insufficient land available to satisfy the numbers that we're talking about. That, that's good on the one hand in terms of the manner in which the township is proceeding, but what it does do is have the court maximize the development that does in fact take place, because if your contention is I have an obligation of 926 units, but I don't have sufficient land, the judge will look at land that is available, whether it's vacant land, whether it's land that's going to be redeveloped, whether it's land that's assembled by a third party, they'll look at that land and say, okay, you're right, you don't have enough land, but the land that you do have and the developers that are proposing to develop that Need, uh, that development needs to maximize the return to try to get to your number. Now, we're never going to get to 926 units. It's never going to happen. But each development is going to be looked at independently and measured against the obligation, and that site will be maximized. And I think that's 
part of what Paul would under that was part of what underlie Paul's comment about additional units from the 62 units that are there. Um, Deborah Nevis, 65 Nolan Road. It, following up on that, um, Mr. Phillips, I was at planning. I've been at a number of planning board meetings. I've been at a lot of these meetings, and I recall several months ago when the master plan revision and review was taking place that you talked about the vacant land adjustment and how that would impact on our uh, obligation for affordable housing units. And at the time, you said that despite the fact that our obligation may be over a thousand, which is what Mr. Buzak presented tonight, that in, in reality, given the vacant land adjustment, the obligation would be significantly less than that. And I don't recall the exact number, but I feel like it was something ar around the number 30 or 50 or something like that. 17. Okay. So that's not what you guys are talking about tonight. You're using the numbers 946, 2611, 1516 as the obligation um, without talking about the vacant land adjustment, which is actually 17. So given what's going in at Mac Cali, which is going to be done from the looks of it by next year, where we have 30 affordable housing units that are there, if we calculate in the vacant land adjustment, we've reached our, our number. So I'm not sure why that hasn't been discussed tonight or so why that's not being taken into consideration. There are two points. So we basically filed a housing plan where we basically requested a significant vacant land adjustment following the COA rules, basically looking at just vacant land, uh, which is why this site wasn't included in the housing plan at the, at the time. Uh, we do know that ultimately that plan, if we hopefully get to it as the next stage, as part of our DJ action, will be negotiated basically with the special master and fair share housing center. Um, as I said, at the time of the, uh, the housing element was adopted, I would uh, certainly uh, feel that there's going to be pushback from fair share housing. They're going to look at sites beyond vacant sites because we have such a fair number, and that's going to be negotiated out. But the critical thing here is, is that the Silverman has builder's remedy status. Uh, and basically what that means is that the, the court has determined basically that Silverman is entitled to something. It's not whether there's going to be housing. Well, it's going course, to be how, how much and housing. No one's asking and the, that And the that court the and the special master are going to view the Silverman settlement, or if it doesn't settle, what's an appropriate number for the Silverman site? Again, in the context of the fact that we are seeking a significant land adjustment, and here's a developer who's assembled property, right, has built his remedy status, and is basically going to say, I can make a significant dent in this affordable housing obligation with a project that may even produce more than 62 units. That's the risk that the municipality. I, I understand has. the risk, but but if we've got 30 going in at Matt Cali, then we've already got almost twice what the vacant land use is. The other question I want to ask can't be answered, but given that I think the attorney for Silverman is here this evening, I want to know what's. I know what we're giving up. I want to know what Silverman is exactly giving up because it's been 62 units for over two years now. They initially presented as 82, that was in January of 2017. By the summer of 2017, they were down to 62, and that has not moved. We are talking about set, setbacks that currently are um, over 10 feet, going down in some places by the Arboretum to one foot, a one foot setback from the property line. What exactly is Silverman giving up? I don't, I, I haven't heard anything that makes me think that they're giving up anything. And it feels to me like we're giving up everything in this. And again, to reiterate what Ms. Blackburn said, bring on the affordable housing. If Silverman is so invested in affordable housing at this site, give, give us the 12 units continue to give us the 12 units of affordable housing that they want to put in there, but reduce the size of the building and keep the 12 units. <laughs> Um, on Woodland Road, it's, it's, uh, 
What I'm going to go over is more uh, things about the ordinance that <coughs> should have been uh, tightened up and can be if it's voted down and rewritten. Uh, number one is uh, the two parking lots on Chatham Road and one on Woodland. It's, uh, it's not a shall they be there. They're, they're all permitted to have them be there. They can now go before the planning board and ask, just like McCallie did, a change to how they did their parking lot. We don't want it on them all on Woodland, and there's nothing there prohibiting them from coming back and asking later to have it all on Woodland. There's not separate parking for the medical center and for the uh, residents. It's combined as far as I can read it. Um, let's see. Uh, as far as when I calculated the density, I added in some at medical group, which I don't think the town did. They just looked at the apartments and they came up with 40 per square, uh, square uh, 40 units per acre. I got closer to 49.50 when I divided up Summit Medical Group into apartments. Like I said before, Duma, using our special master, settled um, the builder's remedy at 22 per acre, similar town to ours near a train station. The appellate division in the Cranford case settled for 23 per acre, bought the property that didn't like that, resold it, and again reduced it further from that amount. You think that the uh, pocket park near uh, the one-story residence is appropriate buffer for the residents? It's not. Those, those leaves go down. Even now, I can see directly at that site. We have a five-foot uh, setback. No buffer is in this agreement at all for that. No screening for the mechanical equipment on top of that building. There is screening for not, 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 not what I, let's see, it's called Lot 7, 1904. There's only screening by the sidewalks, sidewalk viewing parts. I'll let you look at that now. Uh, I asked you to put in requirements that if there are dens, that there be these four requirements. This was not included, which allows those dens to be converted into extra bedrooms. Number one, that a den must adjoin a living room. Two, must be built without closets. Three, access through a wider than usual opening. Four, the addition of a door closet is at all times prohibited. Between occupancy, there must be a CO reissue before subletting or, or, or renewing a lease. This was not included. You are not protecting the people by not including this in your agreement. You've now made two bedroom market units into potential three bedroom. One bedroom into two. That significantly increases the population. There was absolutely no reason not to include that. The builder would have, I'm sure, gladly have agreed, but now it's in the ordinance and we can't do it unless you wrote it down and you go back again. Uh, there is provisions for screening of rooftop mechanical equipment on page 12 of the ordinance. And with regard to the access, the access, there are a two vehicle entries on Chatham Road, which will be built as part of the first phase of the development. Uh, and the first phase of development also includes the uh, medical office space. Uh, so, and there's one provision for the residential entry during the second phase from Woodland Road. Okay. As a lawyer, when I read that, when it says, it, it can have something, or it does not say shall. If you need the driveways, shall be on Chatham Road, shall be on Woodland. Located. Required is not the same as shall. Both entry driveways shall be located at the western end of the building away from the corner of Woodland Road. Where, where are you saying that? On oh, Woodland. You're talking about Woodland. I'm not talking about Woodland. I'm talking about Chatham. It's required. Yeah, inside Chatham Road, away from the intersection of Woodland Road. It's the okay, second that's second. the shell is in the position. That's not the shell is in. I'm not going okay. to argue. All right. Sure. I'd like you to re look, look at, the, at that lot, 107, 1904, and see that we have no buffer, no screening for the mechanical equipment. There's screening. Uh, from the sidewalks. I've got it here. Uh, Shear 101, Oakview Terrace. So if you look on page 11, it says, uh, uh, 
let's see, down under 5C, rooftop mechanical equipment. All major mechanical equipment located on the roof shall be screened from view of all street level sidewalk vantage points along Chatham and Woodland Roads. That means you, just, just like you didn't uh, uh, put in any buffer for the people coming up Oakview Terrace for the, for the pocket part, no, that's all going to be exposed uh, to the pocket part and to the people who live on Oakview Terrace. Am I wrong about that? It depends on what happens at site plan approval. Typically, when you write an ordinance and you have requirements with regard to screening of rooftop equipment, the requirements are the public view shed being the public streets. There will also be at the time of site plan, uh, I'm almost sure that the planning board will ask for basically site line analysis to see where on the rooftop the mechanicals are and how they will be screened from adjacent properties as well. And typically the rooftop mechanic, and these are site plan issues, you can only put so much, and this is a detailed ordinance, typically the site, the, the mechanicals on the roof are centered on the roof, set back from the roof line, this will all be discussed at the site plan stage so that it will also be screened if not obscured from view from adjacent properties. And the other consistent uh, that's thing not here very with, the, with the setbacks here is this site on all sides, right, for getting across the street abuts municipally owned vacant lands on all sides. There's a 200 to 300 foot separation of municipal wooded property between the finger portion feet. and the... 205 feet. So they just sweeped by. If, if you let me finish, it's I said two hundred. It is. I'm entirely accurate. It's two hundred feet basically from the rear, and it's three hundred feet along the frontage because there's a finger portion of the stuff. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. So there's basically two to three hundred yeah, feet of intervening woodlands that provide screening. No. You have the arboretum on the other side, and you have a small slither of municipally owned vacant wooded property next to the arboretum property in Chatham Road. Well, this is you, what this I site abuts, right which is the reason why this zoning can provide for minimal setbacks based on the surrounding land use context. This wasn't done in a vacuum. No, but I don't think you looked at it from a few terrace because I, that's where I live, right at the end of the finger. You can absolutely see it now, even in the, even in the summer and in the winter. It's it's all there. So I don't know what you're talking about. The woodland does not screen it. The what the site does not screen it. Um, I'm not going to argue. You just come and you, 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 know, you can just come and look. But I would like to also ask another question. Oh, well, not very well. I would like to ask another question. Why is our town treated differently than other towns? Um, uh, Ms. Cosgrove just came and told you about Vanish's own uh, uh, decisions, or Vanish's own record, the towns in which he was involved in, decisions in which he was involved in, where the density was much, much less. Um, why, why should our town, what, tell me, uh, because of course, Mr. Buza, you are so experienced in all these projects. What 1.5 acre? Tell me about the 1.5 acre sites um, in a in a in a uh, in a development um, in, in a location such as ours that have this that, where where there is uh, uh, 10,000 feet of um, uh, if you want to say commercial activity, Summit Medical Group, which is of course a really bad kind of commercial activity because. No 24 hour means anything because it can be 23 hours if they, if they want. All right, and there is going to be an urgent care center there. So what has, aside from that, what has 10,000 square feet of commercial activity and then this uh, um, 52 units? Can you tell me some other towns? At where a 1.5 acre lot in a, in, a res, in a primarily residential section is carrying that? You can't look at <clears throat> Uh, density in a vacuum you have to look at each case on its own merits you have to look at whether or not a municipality has satisfied its obligation has done anything to satisfy its obligation or it has not you have to look at whether a builder's remedy lawsuit was filed you have a to, remedy lawsuit. I, I, I understand like a builder's remedy lawsuit. But, I thought I didn't understand. I thought I, I was talking about a settlement of a builder's remedy law. I was settled on those kind of terms. I get it. I get okay. it. Okay. 
So what are the but examples? The, the point I am making is that you cannot compare one municipality with another municipality because everything is determined in the context of a particular situation. Every situation is unique. Paul can talk about Duan and what's surround. Do you know what's surrounding those municipal that, that development? Talks about it, and it's not nearly as much as it's, we're talking about a huge difference. But do you know what surrounds that site to which you so refer? I, I'd be happy to know. We but, do. But okay, Gina I'm not asking us. you, sir. I'm, a, I'm asking Gina, the individual. All right, let, Paul, why don't you talk about Duan? You're familiar with it. Well, again, I, I, you know, I want to echo Ed's comments. Each case is fact sensitive, and it depends on the circumstances. It all has to be taken into account. I will tell you that the Dumont site, the 22 acres of the Dumont site, I've looked at that site. There are small lot single family homes that abut that site on all sides with very little setback. Well, well, say no, but I've looked at it. I didn't say no. I just said I heard a no, but I, I'm I, telling you what the context is. Okay, but so but the, this is a residential area too. Just because we have a park, a little park there, doesn't doesn't make it doesn't make that difference. So what what I'm taking away from here is that you, you don't know anybody that got no town got as bad a deal as this settlement offers us. Um, that's what I'm taking away. And in terms of oh, we need we need to be punished for not having for not having done what we should have done for fair share housing. Well, where were you? You were our lawyers. Why didn't you get us a plan? It was, it was completely clear at that um, at that meeting. Uh, what was it? Uh, a year ago, November or whatever. Is that what I went? And I went out saying, well, obviously we have to have an affordable housing plan. What where were we? Yeah, where were we? Why weren't we advised to get a for an affordable housing plan uh, before we did? Thank you. Okay, our last question. There was much discussion over the years, from my standpoint at any rate, about the desirability of advancing a plan in light of the fact that Milburn had not really taken any affirmative action with respect to affordable housing. Uh, the Township Committee got Trey advice, uh, some of it from the, their constituents, uh, in one instance from another attorney, and they elected not to proceed in that direction. We don't sit up here writing the laws of the town. We give advice. If the advice is taken, then certain things happen. If it isn't, then there are other policy considerations that the Township Committee has in mind beyond the considerations that we raise, then uh, things move in another direction. But there was no, uh, I, I think, the implication of your remark was that we were somehow asleep at the stick and we should have made all of this happen, and that's, that's not how it operates. Hi, I'm Regina Curdy from um, 310 Taylor Road South. I just have one question, and maybe, I don't know if, you, if this is the right um, group to ask this to, but I'd like to know, um, was the mayor at the time of the settlement agreement with Cheryl Burstein, um, who has now recruited <coughs> herself from the um, project and discussion of the project was she involved in the negotiation and and how will we let play now that she is no longer involved with with the group because she has a conflict uh, she was one of the original <laughs> uh, mayor Bearstein was included on the mediation team along with Check out any books, go ahead. Uh, and um, she had no uh, reason to be conflicted out uh, whatsoever at any time, up until the beginning of August, when she learned, as a partner in her firm, that Silverman had acquired a building that her firm had under lease to someone else who sold it to Silverman. When she learned that, she had contacted me and she said, you got to take a look at this. Uh, I, I, I'm the partner, managing partner of the firm. I'll be negotiating a lease. And I pointed out to her, we took a look at the law of the recent cases that have been uh, decided. And the local, uh, the, the local ethics law says that an elected official or a municipal official shall not act in any matter where either they 
or a business organization with which they are associated is <clears throat> involved with a party who is before the community seeking some approval or a negotiation or something. As soon as she learned about this, she brought it out and she did the right thing. She recused herself. She didn't participate in the uh, uh, mediation after that point. So I hope that answers your question. I don't know where that uh, lady went, but that is the answer. that had been traditionally utilized by the Council on Affordable Housing, which was the administrative agency prior to the courts taking this over in 2015, and that the courts have utilized is, is generally a 15% set aside of affordable units to market units, uh, to total units, uh, if it is a rental project, and a 20% set aside if it is a sales project. Uh, so, can the number of affordable units be increased? Sure, but that comes at the cost of increasing the related market units, the other 80%. Uh, can, There's can those... never a way to negotiate. that You, you haven't found that that's a negotiable point. Well, the, re and the, the reason for that uh, is that the additional market units are utilized, or the return from those additional market units, whether it be sales returns, or rental returns are utilized to subsidize the costs of the low and moderate income unit. So the residents there, um, the reason the developer gets an additional density bonus is to give that developer the ability to subsidize the low and moderate income units, which if you look at the, and there was a, a chart up there and it's going to be available on the website, if you look at the incomes of the individuals for a four-person household, for and you look at the rentals, those rentals are well below market. Yet the units themselves, in this case, are going to be integrated within the entire development. So there's not going to be a, an affordable housing building of 12 units. It's going to be integrated throughout. And those, those additional market units are utilized to subsidize the rents for the low income units. Of course, and uh, obviously I'm assuming the Summit Medical piece is fully encompassed and taken into account in balancing that. You're not just looking at units, is that correct? No. No. But isn't that, doesn't that not make sense? That's a major, I'm just asking. Again, <laughs> I'm all about negotiating and working things out, but you would think that's certainly pointed out and I would hope there lawyers have, you know, as being a good neighbor, take that into consideration. So that's just Can I just, one thing sure. that I, I think it's important, this point was made, and you might not have been here at the time, but the presumptive set-asides that Ed mentioned, 15% for rental and 20% for sales, generally speaking, are irrespective of density. The way this has been applied throughout municipalities in the state, that's been my experience. We did, in fact, negotiate a higher set-aside for this property because the developer intends to build rental housing. The presumptive rental set-aside is 15%, and we negotiated close to 
just a fraction under 20%, so we're getting 12 of those 62 units to be affordable, where again, the presumptive set aside would have been just 15%. We did negotiate that. Okay, but, but it does never, it never takes into account something like assignment medical or in our particular case, that's just not being taken into account. And again, I'm trying to be difficult with you, I'm really trying to understand. So typically what happens, and there have been other mixed use inclusionary developments throughout the state, such as in downtown areas where you might have round floor retail and upper floor residential. Sure. Typically, the set-aside only goes with the residential portion and not any commercial component, right. as Ed explained. That's right. typically the way it's right. I guess that would be certainly an area that you can imagine while people would have great frustration with and doesn't feel, it feels wrong. And so, again, no one doesn't want that there, and I think we're all trying to brainstorm and think of ways, how can we have this without it feeling so massive and not trying to unwelcome someone who's coming in to perhaps do something nice to our neighborhood. This isn't nice, it's just so obtrusive, and we're just saying, let's just bring it back a bit. And what are some ways we can think outside the box to help do that without, you know, so that's, that's all, but thank you very much. Thank you, and I think I can say for everyone sitting up here, and you may not believe what I'm gonna say, but we do understand your pain on this, but we also understand the position that the township is in a builder's remedy lawsuit, which is not basically coming at this from the position of strength, if you will. We do understand your concerns, and we do understand, as I said in, in sort of my opening s uh, statement, that the densities and the heights here, if it weren't for the builder's remedy suit, would, would not even be considered. But again, the whole world changes when you're put in this position of a builder's remedy suit. And I will again stress that there is indeed a risk that if this is litigated, that it could be more than the 62 units, it could be taller and it could be denser. That's the risk and reward that this municipality faces with regard to this litigation. Hi, Allison Roth, 36 Elmwood Place. I'm on the corner of Woodland. Um, not one of the 20% of the lawyers, but I am a mom in the neighborhood, and I do actually drive up Woodland Road up to Chatham about 10 to 20 times a day. I also walk in the neighborhood. Um, my kids walk in the neighborhood, and my kids have learned to drive in the neighborhood. And I'm appalled by this traffic study that I saw today. This um, conclusion basically says that everything would continue to operate acceptably. Um, I don't know if anybody knows how many people in Melbourne Short Hills have been hit by cars. Um, we did have a fatality, as somebody mentioned, right on the corner of that road. I myself have been hit by a car, not on that road, but in the township. Other mothers have been hit by cars. Um, one has a stroke and teachers have been hit by cars and have been debilitated, and this is a serious issue. And what I am um, asking of you is to not just push aside and give us some BS traffic study, but just really study the road. Because I drive up and down that road, it curves, people don't hug the curves, there are cars coming at each other, there are little kids, there are kids biking, there are kids walking to school, there are millions of people coming from the train, going to the train. This is happening all day long. And any good developer, I'm sure Silverman is a nice man with children of his own, and if, he, if he's a developer, he should be looking at the traffic studies. If you have 62 new apartments, that's at least 124 cars. Um, everybody has at least two cars, some may have four. And it's a very, uh, it's a very serious issue. I mean, you have a neighborhood of kids, half of them are learning to drive, half of them don't stop at the stop signs. It's a very dangerous road, and please, I implore you to a different, a real traffic study, and really study the neighborhood and what's going on, and take it into account, or Silverman's gonna have a lot more lawsuits on his hands than this. Ted Prince, I live at uh, Forest Drive, one Forest Drive. Just referring to on page five of this handout you gave us, uh, on the top of it, 
You said if the township obtains a judgment of compliance and repose, it will be required to implement its, its approved test step, whatever that is. Then it, then it says the township will then have immunity from builder's remedy lawsuits until July 1st, 2025. Could you explain that? Is that the course we're going? I'd, I'd kind of like to hear from you guys what your course of action in the future is uh, to kind of represent the interest that you're hearing here tonight. What, how can we delay this until you know somebody gets more information, some more decisions from the courts? Well, the the, the, the township's plan is to uh, obtain a judgment of compliance and repose based upon the housing element and fair share plan that it filed. We talked about the vacant land adjustment, right. the fact that it's likely there's going to be pushback from that, so there's going to have to be some adjustments uh, to that. But the objective of this township committee, and I want to, I want to point that out again. Kit talked about uh, the fact uh, after questions were raised concerning advice that the township was given. Uh, this township committee has taken it on. Now you can look at, at prior township committees and, and criticize them. That does no one any good because there's competing interests and, and th those decisions can't be uh, second guessed. What can be uh, determined here is that this township committee has taken the bull by the horns and as you can see what they're faced with is not support. There's general support, there's comments about yes we need to satisfy our obligation. When it comes down to exactly doing that you see what the committee is faced with and that's what the township committees I think in the past were concerned about. This township committee has decided to take on that task and they're doing it. Our objective is to get that judgment of compliance proposed based upon the housing element and fair share plan okay. and obtain the immunity. Right now, we do have immunity. We have temporary immunity, not from the builder's remedy lawsuit that was filed three days before we filed our declaratory yeah. judgment action, but after that, we now have immunity, and it's important for us as a municipality to maintain that immunity while we resolve the balance of the obligation. And that's the housing element and fair share plan. Okay, what's the, what's the um, timetable on this? Well, the timetable is uh, the, the next step after this matter is resolved one way or the other is to get to that housing element and fair share plan. We've already gotten comments from Fair Share Housing Center on the housing element and fair share plan. As uh, none of us were surprised that they didn't say, yep, 17 is your number. That's it, that's all you need to do. They pushed back and challenged a number of the decisions that were made with regard to vacant land that was not, uh, land that was not included in the vacant land analysis. So we're starting that process. That will also be mediated by the special master, Frank Banish. Do you have a timetable or not? Uh, well, the judges are looking at years, it. Years or is it, are you talking months, years? Uh, our immunity ends September 30th of this year. We, we would seek, as we have in the past, uh, to continue that immunity, but we're only given immunity for short bursts of time. We're given immunity for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, while we move forward with the process. Okay. The idea is that these cases will be resolved, hopefully, by the end of 2020. Maybe before that, but certainly the courts are looking as, as Kit said earlier, to get these things off the docket. Okay. So that's the best timetable we, we can that's talk a about. Here. Yes. Tom Hilsner, 10 Exeter Road. Short Hills. I have been listening carefully to the many thoughtful comments people have been making. In my own mind, I have a couple of loose ends, but I, and I'd like to get some answers to them. One of which is this uh, housing element and fair share plan, which as I understand from the materials we filed in April of 2018, that the builder's remedy suit was filed a few days before that. And I took it by implication from what Mr. Falcon said, although I'm not asking him to direct to say it more specifically, that there was advice that we should file this. Let me ask one question. Had we filed this plan before this builder's remedy, would that have been a way to avoid this suit? Would it have solved the problem? 
had we filed the declaratory judgment action before and obtained immunity, which is usually not simultaneous, it's usually within a couple of weeks they have to file it. All right, lawsuit. so let's say we, we filed it in the, on it, April 1st, or March 15th, some reasonable time before we did it. Is the fact of the matter is but that we were late in filing this, and as a result, we have this exposure, which if it had been filed earlier, we never would have had. Had the, had the DJ action been filed earlier and the immunity been granted earlier, the, the, the builder's remedy lawsuit would have been precluded. Now, understand that the next step that builders take in these cases is they move to intervene in the case. And if they move to intervene early when the case is filed, they're allowed an intervener status. The difference between a builder's remedy lawsuit and intervener status is that intervener status gives a builder the right to sit at the table, but doesn't give him necessarily the right to have his property included in the plan. They can push for their property, they can, they can lobby for their property, but they don't necessarily get their property in the plan. Builder's remedy, on the other hand, gets their property in the plan so long as they can satisfy the, the minimal obligations that we're talking about. All right, so they would have, they, oh, go ahead. It, it's not uncommon, Tom, in these things. We're not operating in a vacuum. As a matter of fact, Paul Ed and I had the same circumstance in Morris Plains. The developer sees that the planning board is working on a housing element fair share plan. So they run down and file a builder's remedy lawsuit. Yeah, but that's not what happened here. We talked about this in 2017. I was at that meeting. If I recall, Mr. Buzzard, you spoke with a very good presentation, outlined all the things you did tonight. And we had a year in which to take some action. And it was clear then that that was going to be, in fact, you may even have recommended it then, but don't, I won't put words in your mouth. But it was clear then, and we waited a whole year. And then within, you know, it's one thing, we thought of it two days before, and we couldn't get it done three days before they, they filed their lawsuit. But we sat on it, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, we sat on this for a year when people knew that this would have been a protection that we dearly need, and what you seem to concede would have been the protection, even though the, the builder would have had a spot at the table and would have had some things to say, it's not the same thing as a builder's remedy suit. Am I correct? That's correct, it's not the same. What I'm saying though, I however, is that. whenever it got done, I'm quite confident that the builder involved, as well as other diligent developers who are in this business and keep a strict eye on what all the communities are doing, would have filed this suit. Yeah. Two other quick questions. My understanding is that there was no environmental study done. Is that correct? No. Well, the, 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 in, uh, the inference I got from a previous speaker was that there are, potentially, she, she pointed out some uh, possible environmental issues. And would not, you know, why wasn't it done, or was it checked out whether there were possible issues? And if so, would not those have been possible leverage for us in the negotiations? Is that so far-fetched that we should not look into <coughs> environmental conditions and to see whether or not we have some basis to use that as a defense? We had the same situation again in Morris Plains. This is a situation the developer has to deal with. If the property is contaminated in any respect, is unbuildable, then they have to remediate it. They have to get the permits that are needed in order to get closure on that from the DEP. The township doesn't undertake an environmental study of every property, even a builder's remedy property that is proposed to be developed. Those burdens fall upon the developer to comply with the applicable environmental regulations. Okay. My last question is this. We've heard about all of the, you know, each party in the negotiation is uh, judging their strengths and weaknesses. And we've heard of the possible exposures we have, and it's, uh, from my point of view, it's helpful to understand what the issues are. But what are, uh, what are our strengths? What were the issues, what are our greatest defenses? What is it that we had in our quiver of arrows that made them want to settle? What, where, if we go to litigation, what, you know, what do we have to say that you think are our strongest arguments, regardless of the prediction of whether they prevail or not? going to talk about the arguments that we're going to make in any outcome. Well, you made them already. There's a but what attorney are, over here taking copious notes. I don't think I'm going to get into that uh, matter.
coincidence, but um, many a time, actually, Mr. Cosgrove would come to the meetings. I don't think he's missed a meeting for a year and a half or something. And he wanted to know what's going on in the mediation. And I wanted to say, if you only knew what they were asking for and what we got them to, you'd be thrilled. But I couldn't do that, and I can't do it now. No, fair I, enough. I was under a confidentiality ban, and I can't discuss the numbers. I can tell you it was a substantially higher number than where we are now, which is where we began. But I, I can't literally get into the strengths and weaknesses of the respective parties' cases at this point. Okay. This, this will be our last question for the evening. Sandy Kimmel, 7 Briar Road Drive. So, I'm not an attorney, but I've heard your discussion. And my concern is that in the future, from what I'm hearing here, there is absolutely no um, blockage to another real estate developer buying a property in downtown as it come available and build a 10 story monstrosity and use the, the lever of the Mount Laurel decision to build that high density property. Am I mistaken in that? I, I think, as we said earlier, uh, so long as we continue to maintain our immunity, uh, we have protections from that and we can advance the plan that we are attempting to advance. But until we, until we get a judgment of compliance and repose, that risk remains out there. So the, the quicker we move forward, the better. And the second question is, I'm sure there's a very contentious um, moral decision in how it's been enforced. What's the way to prevent this from happening? To me, I mean, I understand the need for affordable housing. And I think many of the residents here are sympathetic with that. On the other hand, it seems to be the, the, the best game in town for the real estate developers to build properties in places where they shouldn't be built. Is this a legislative or a, a judicial issue that residents of New Jersey have to address? Uh, it, it's a constitutional issue created by the judiciary. The judiciary made a determination that because municipalities have obtained their power to regulate land, to zone within their respective municipalities, that derives from the Constitution, the New Jersey State Constitution, and as a result of that, a municipality is charged with the obligation to exercise that power to support the general welfare. The general welfare has been defined by the Supreme Court in the Mount Laurel decisions as including uh, providing a realistic opportunity through those zoning ordinances that the municipality has the power to enact the Constitution to provide a realistic opportunity for the, the construction of the municipality's fair share of the region's low and moderate income housing needs. And can the legislature change that? Legislature cannot change the Constitution. The people can change the Constitution well, to a vote. Could the legislature pass laws that render parts of the Mount Laurel decision? To no, what they can, legislature can do two things. Number one, they can place on the ballot a constitutional amendment question to deal with it. If they adopt that, then that can be placed on the ballot. That's one way to deal with it, change the Constitution. The second way to deal with it is not to change the obligation, but change the administration of that obligation, which the legislature did through the Fair Housing Act. And that, that worked, some people will say, not necessarily great, but it avoided, uh, prevented much litigation between 1985 and 2015. <clears throat> For those 30 years, I guess that is, uh, it worked. Uh, and in the last five years of it, it didn't work. The court took it back. And now there's no administrative process, or, and we're back to where the court found in 1983 was about the worst possible way to deal with these issues. Now we're stuck with it again. It's deja vu all over again. Thank you. Sure. This will be the last question of the evening. Dan Iverson, uh, Free Factory Drive. I, I read the, compre the Comprehensive Affordable Housing Plan. And it says in part, our Supreme Court has warned developers 
against litigation threats as a bargaining chip in their affordable housing applications. I think we're being threatened all the time with this, and, and, and it's nasty. Thank you all for coming. As I stated, everything will be put on the website uh, tomorrow for the residents.